Today's subject is the neurological surgery of the vestibular cochlear nerve. First, we'll start by some reminders on the anatomical notions and then we'll concentrate on the surgery. The vestibular cochlear nerve is at first separated in two nerves before it becomes one nerve. Let's take a look at the course of the cochlear nerve. The proteinurin cell body is situated in the spiral ganglion of corti in the cochlea. Then, the nerve passes through the internal acoustic meatus where it joins the facial nerve and gets to the region of the cerebellopontine angle. The first neuron synapses with the second one in the cochlear nucleus on the fourth ventricle floor. After decusation, the nerve gets to the imperial colliculus and the acoustic radiations join the temporal cortex. Now about the vestibular nerve. Its proteinurin cell body is located in the vestibular ganglion of scarpa. Then, it goes through the internal acoustic meatus with the cochlear and facial nerves to get to the cerebellopontine angle. The synapse between first and second neuron occurs in the vestibular nucleus on the fourth ventricle floor. From there, the nerve divides into three branches. The common emergence of the vestibular and cochlear nerves on the frontal side of the brainstem is in the bulbopontine sulcus laterally to the facial nerve. The functions of the nerve are hearing for the cochlear nerve and balance for the vestibular nerve. Let's now talk about the surgery of this nerve. The main reason to resort to vestibular cochlear surgery is the case of an acoustic neuroma. It is the most frequent tumor of the posterior compartment. The schwannoma is a benign tumor developed from the schwann cells of the nerve's chest. The spontaneous evolution consists in a vestibular cochlear and facial nerves compression in the internal acoustic canal, causing a progressive unilateral deafness, tinnitus and dizziness. The facial paralysis and anesthesia can also be observed. The tumor's classification is the following. Grade 1, tumor is small, occurring only within the internal auditory canal. Grade 2, tumor extends into the fluid spaces around the brainstem. Grade 3, larger tumor, up to 2.5 cm, extends up to the brainstem. Grade 4, very large tumor, up to 5 cm, compresses the brainstem, involving the nerves of the swallowing and the fifth cranial nerve. This classification justifies the choice of the surgical approaching way, which can be the middle fossa approach, the translabyrinthine approach, or the retrosigmoid suboccipital approach. The middle fossa approach is indicated if hearing is to be preserved and for tumors at grade 1 or 2. The surgery begins by a temporal craniotomy above the ear. Then the temporal dura and part of the temporal lobe are removed. After removal of the petrous bone, we can see the sinus of the internal carotid artery, the relief of the cochlea. You can see here that the cerebellum stentorium has to be carefully resected to access the posterior fossa dura and the vestibular cochlear nerve. The advantage here is the hearing preservation for tumors up to 2 cm, but it requires a retraction of the temporal lobe and facial nerve injuries are frequent. In those cases, radiotherapy is now preferred. The retrosigmoid suboccipital approach is also indicated if hearing is to be preserved and for tumors at grade 2 to 4. First, the occipital craniotomy and the cerebellar dura removal is performed. Afterwards, the tumor is debulked. Then, the tumorous capsule is removed with careful preservation of its close neural connections. In fact, you can see here that the brainstem, the cerebellum, the facial and trigeminal nerves are very close to the tumor. This way may also preserve the hearing and is less risky for the facial nerve. But hearing is still lost in 50% of the cases and the retraction of the cerebellum causes balance problems. The translabyrinthine approach cannot assure a preservation of the hearing and is indicated for tumors at grade 3 or 4. This approach has two steps. First, the otorhinolaryngologist's approach and then the neurosurgeon's approach. The first step begins with the mastoid bone removal. We can identify the anatomical landmarks, the digastric muscle, the posterior wall of the external acoustic matrix and the inferior part of the temporal muscle.
After a total mastoidectomy, we can see the posterior wall of the external acoustic meatus, the temporal and cerebellar dura, the digastric muscle, and the semicircular canals relief. The first step continues with the osseous labyrinth removal. Firstly, the semicircular canals are removed. Secondly, the internal acoustic canal is exposed. By the end of the first step, we can identify the inferior and superior margins of the internal acoustic canal and the canal itself. After the operation table has been toppled over, the second step of the approach begins by a dura removal. Then the cerebellum is pushed aside with an excavator. We can approach the tumor from the top with its connection. The inferior and superior vestibular nerves, the cochlear and facial nerves. Then the neuroma can be removed. First, the tumor is developed. The capsule is finally removed, always carefully to spare the arachnoid and the close connections of the tumor. This approach is often performed because it is taught at school, it's the less risky one for the facial nerve and it gives a good exposure of the tumor, but it leads to a total deafness and the loss of the vestibular apparatus and a possible fistula of the cerebrospinal fluid. About the complications, the mortality rate of the surgery is 1% and by incomplete tumor removal, a recurrency may occur in the 4 or 5 years following. Other complications affecting the quality of life are very frequent. The vestibular cochlear function is affected in a high majority of the cases with deafness and imbalance. The facial nerve function is almost always disrupted even if the nerve itself is almost always preserved during the surgery.